Oh, thanks a lot for uh, having me here. Very excited about it. Um, so I will be talking about uh, the k-hemming distance problem and how we can prove an optimal lower bound to it through understanding how heat behaves. So hemming distance, uh, given two strings x and y, the hemming distance is the number of coordinates in which they differ. So here, in this case, they differ in four coordinates. So we show that the k-hemming distance is hard to compute in various computational models. Uh, in communication complexity, we show that any two players need uh, k log k bits to uh, compute this, which I will define all these models. In the property testing model, um, well, we, we show that any property tester for k linearity requires k log k queries. And in per the decision trees, the corresponding problem is the k hemming weight. And for that, an exponential in k log k size lower bound holds similarly. OK. So let's go to our first model, communication complexity. So in this model, we have two players, traditionally called Alice and Bob. And we give them two bit strings with the promise that their hemming distance is at most k. And they have access to a shared random source. And their goal is to communicate and then output the hemming distance of x and y. Notice that this is a number between 0 and k uh, under our promise. All right. So let's see um, the optimal k log k protocol, which is, uh, as far as I know, folklore and not too difficult. So consider the graph on the bit strings. And unlike the Hamming graph, we place an edge between u and v if they are Hamming distances at most 2k. And Alice and Bob fixes a proper coloring of this graph. And the protocol is this. Alice just sends the color of x, her string, over to Bob. And then Bob declares the closest string to y, her string, with the given color as x. And we claim that this recovers x in entirety under this promise, because suppose there was this other x prime with the same color, orange color, that Alice sent. And suppose that it was smaller in distance to y. But we know that with the promise we were given, having I mean, distance of x and y is at most k. And this is even smaller by triangle inequality. The having distance of x and x prime is at most 2k, but they have the same color, which is not possible. So that justifies our claim that re this recovers x. Now, having recovered x and having y, um, well, Bob can do like Hamming distance calculation as well as anything else. So the, the catch is that this, uh, the graph, we need roughly n choose 2k colors to, to the maximum degree is n choose 2k, uh, roughly. So we need k log n bits, really. But the interesting thing is that, I mean, since we, by hashing, we can reduce the uh, n to 10k squared without introducing more than, let's say, 1 over 20 error. Uh, so only this last part actually requires shared randomness here. All right, so let's uh, go to uh, what was known. Uh, so we solved this, um, the first line of one run protocol. And then the classical disjointness lower bound applies here, giving an omega k lower bound. And for one round, there's some better uh, results. Um, so this, this was what we knew up until 2011. So let's go to our second model, property testing. Sir, could you put that back Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, no, uh, you don't know k log k for quantum communication complexity? Well, it's not true. Uh, the, in, the, in a recent uh, work, we uh, kind of, I, I'll explain. Oh, mm -hmm. okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. okay, so in, yeah, and this, this um, for, for just finding the intersection size of two sets, Rosborough proved a omega k lower bound, and that's actually turns out to be tight. Um, so second, second model, uh, the property testing model. Here in this model, um, well, I'll define this model through the uh, problem k-linearity. So a function from f2 to the n to f2 is called k-linear if it's the inner product of the input with some secret or some w um, of uh, Hamming weight at most k. Uh, in other words, this function just um, sums up at most k coordinates of the input in mod 2. 
uh, th that's a k-linear function. So now the task is, given black box, black box a a query access to other otherwise unknown function g, we are, uh, if g is k-linear, we're supposed to accept. And if uh, for any f that is k-linear, the distance of f and g is uh, epsilon fraction of the possible inputs, then we are supposed to reject. And if it doesn't satisfy either, we can output anything. We are not expected uh, anything in other cases. So now the goal is to, uh, what is the num what num minimum number of queries uh, we need to be able to distinguish these two cases? Um, so in 2011, uh, Blay, Brody, and Matulev established a connection between the k-hamming distance problem and the property testing. In particular, they show that if one can prove a lower bound to k-hamming distance, we get automatically lower bounds for k-linearity, k-juntas, k-DNFs, and even more problems that people studied a lot in um, the property testing world. So this naturally brought in a new interest in the k-hamming distance problem. So after this, um, okay. Oh, before before we go, okay. So here is what was known for k linearity. Uh, so there are, um, let's say, one round upper bounds for uh, k linearity, the third line with k log k uh, queries, and uh, through this communication uh, connection, they also showed an omega k uh, lo lower bound and. And another uh, sort of combinatorial approach, direct approach, that, that's essentially what uh, we had. And we had this gap of a uh, lower bound of omega k versus, uh, well, k log k upper bound. And we kind of knew even one round k log k uh, upper bounds. OK, so now after this uh, connection, uh, here is uh, what happened to the k Hamming distance problem. In 2012, um, people proved k log k uh, lower bounds. And later, we showed the k log iterated r times k for any r round protocol. And um, well, after that, a lower bound of k log 1 over delta was shown. And well, usually delta is a constant, uh, which may not look like that much of a improvement, the thing is that this is the first bound that separates k-disjointness uh, and k-hemming problem. Such a bound cannot possibly hold for k-disjointness problem. And now, now in this work, we show the optimal k log k divided by delta lower bound. OK, so um, let's go to our third model, uh, parity decision trees. Um, suppose a secret w uh, is chosen, and our goal is to decide if the Hemming weight is at most k. And to, to be able to do so, we cannot just look at it, but we can only make linear queries of the form. Uh, we can present a vector and get the inner product in mod 2. And um, so assume um, I choo we choose some uh, x and get the answer. And depending on the answer, we get to choose another x and get the inner product again and again. And eventually, we are supposed to say, yes, the Hemming weight is at most k, or no, the Hemming weight of w is more than that. So the, maybe it's clear, but it's a generalization of the usual decision tree model where you just query a bit. Right. Yeah, yeah we have, um, we can query single bits or just the uh, XOR of any uh, number of them as we uh, please. And it's also clear that it can be easily simulated by communication. Right, right. Um, so here, um, we two, the com two complexity measures that we are uh, concerned with is the size uh, and the depth. The depth is the number of uh, queries, size is something else. Um, so let's uh, see how these three models connect with each other. So just uh, by being a binary tree, we have uh, this, uh, I mean, the logarithm of the size of a PDT is a lower bound to the height of it. So we have this immediately. And uh, by a simulation argument, we can also see that any uh, well, per the decision tree can be converted to communication protocol. And because of that, we have this um, in inequality. And likewise, you know, another simulation argument shows that the 
property testing is lower bounded by PDT uh, depth, the number of queries you make there. And in 2011, this, this is the connection that they established. Um, um, so they show they lower bound the property testing directly by the K Hamming distance. And I think that this is more general, not, not just for uh, K linearity, but it applies to other problems. So this is um, our main theorem. We show that we, we prove something about the Markov chains, how heat behaves, and this uh, implies a K log K lower bound to uh, either uh, PDT size or the uh, K Hamming distance communication complexity. Uh, I should add that these are incomparable uh, as far as we know. So, so it doesn't prove uh, size lower bound on the communication protocol? Um, I don't know, but um, it proves something about this in the expect. It proves a bound on this uh, poly, uh, polytope relaxation of communication. So, but um, I don't see that maybe, I don't think it can be related to the size of the protocol. I'm not sure. Yeah, it's just the analog of the size in the decision tree, right? I mean, it's just. The, the, if you simulate a parity decision tree by communication protocol, mm -hmm. that protocol looks exactly like level three. They don't change the size of that everything. I mean, that's the same abstract object. Okay. If you prove a low bound on the size, and if you prove a low bound only on the depth. Yes. Um, okay. It's a stronger model. I hear. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I have to think a little bit before I uh, before I say something. Uh, mm -hmm. It, mm -hmm. Okay. So now. Um, I will explain only the upper branch here. So how we get uh, from a statement about Markov chains to PDTs, and then the rest we d discussed already. Um, so now, uh, mm -hmm. Ah, okay. So what we um, we delayed this one. So are we delaying this? Yeah. So. The, you, yeah, it's up to uh, you. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll I'll tell uh, more offline, but just um, it's similar to corruption bound, except that here one has to cut the polytope with some hyper, proper hyperplanes. Usual uh, corruption bound uh, with some added things. Um, okay, so now suppose that we have a parity decision tree that accepts low hemming weight strings, W, and rejects the high hemming weight. So for uh, a weight uh, between 0 and N, uh, this is the response. And so might, uh, now we're going to talk just about parity decision trees. So yes. the queries which are linear functions of this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Now we can easily convert this to a PDT where it accepts hemming weight exactly K and rejects Hemming weight k minus two and k plus two, and we can do that as follows: we run two parallel pair uh, decision trees, one with parameter k, one with parameter k minus one, and we say yes only if the first one says yes and the second one says no. That just can happen when the Hemming weight is k. So I mean, this is uh, okay. Let's uh, so. Now, this is actually a randomized model. So this is what it's supposed to output. But it's actually out, it outputs something like this. Let AK be the fraction of weight K inputs that are accepted. So it will look like something, uh, something like this. When the weight is not K, it will accept with probability at most delta. Otherwise, it will accept with probability at least 1 minus delta. Now, so we will, in the following slides, show that the way heat behaves implies that if the PDT is small, this sequence, especially on the same pair of coordinates, has to behave somewhat like a log convex function. In particular, no sharp peaks allowed. If the sharp peak uh, AK was large, then it would say that the product of AK minus 2 and AK plus 2 has to be large. In particular, at least one of them has to be large. Um, all right, so let's um, look at the contribution of a single leaf. So what inputs are, let's say, accepted at this particular yes leaf? Exactly. So they will, 
you know, we, we, we will have this W, which is the secret, and we test it with a bunch of X's. And to be able to get there, uh, we know what the answer to each of these must be. So this, this is an affine subspace. For, uh, well, we have a matrix A, and we multiply W with A, and the answer has to be B. So that's, that's the cell T, the, which, which is the set of inputs accepted at this particular leaf, is given by this inequality. Uh, equality. So now we ask, can T have a lot of weight K vectors, but very few uh, weight K minus 2 and weight K plus 2 vectors? Not by the way, if we don't want and here, but or is easy to satisfy. It's just the end you cannot satisfy. OK, so now this is our W, and this is our uh, affine subspace matrix. Now we want to. Uh, how do you satisfy it? Is it uh, why is it easy to satisfy the law? So, I mean, we can have. Um, a affine subspace which has a lot of weight k and not comparably large k plus uh, very compar little k plus two and likewise we can right. but you, you're, you're saying the statement no, you're not uh, telling it uh, how the example why no why so what what would be the you say we can easily have such a subspace what is the subspace oh what is the subspace yeah. um well for one um plus k plus one coordinates. So okay. All combinations of plus k plus one coordinates. So for the okay, we want to so you can split split the in, uh, the input into um, k equal size parts and require that the parity in each of them is o odd. Yeah, it's the same as last class. It doesn't mm. have to be equal size part as examples. Right. So th that shows one side. For the other side, there's another example. Um, OK, so now we wanted to understand, can it be that there's some fixed weight uh, at which the acceptance probability is so much higher than uh, the adjacent probabilities? To, to understand it, we will uh, look at it the following way. So now let's start with W the w vector equal to 0. And we do a random walk on the w as follows. Just pick a coordinate uniformly at random and flip it. And now as we do a walk on this uh, w, there's a projected random walk happening here. So whenever I add a 1 to one of the coordinates of w, the corresponding column is added to this b. So now, as I do a random walk uh, at w, this induces a random walk on a times w. And notice that I mean this is linear. So if when w is 0, a w is also 0. And we only accept when the a w reaches b. So there's some random walk happening on this smaller dimension. The a is this vector, uh, the, the matrix, big. So this is our um, matrix. It fixes a path, and it fixes the subspace. Uh -huh. This is the generator of the subspace. And then we are looking at the same A as before. Yeah, although and you switch, uh, if you switch a bit of W, you should go to a different path in the parity decision tree, right? No, W. No, 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 no. these are the queries. W, uh -huh. like these are fixed queries. W is different the input. Inputs, yeah. Different, it's just different inputs W. So right, but if you change the input, then you go down a different path, possibly, in the tree. No, no, the, the input, sorry, it's, it's change the function. W is a function. W is a function. It You're may, uh, well, it may be, but I'm just looking at whether it will, I'm just only worried about this yes, particular yes leaf. I'm, I'm just looking whether that, that will come to my leaf. Oh, okay. If it doesn't, I, I just say it didn't. If oh, it okay. came, I, I'm happy. So that's. OK, so we just do a random walk on this top vector w. And then it induces a random walk on a times w. And whenever this a times w um, hits b, then it, at time, uh, particular time, we accept. So now also observe that if 
t is like uh, smaller than square root of n, and we do this doubly random walk for t time steps, the probability 0.9, I will have exactly Hemingway t. Uh, because what can go wrong is that I may flip the same coordinate twice, I may lose those things, but by a birthday paradox kind of thinking, you can see that if t is much smaller than square root of n, this doesn't happen. So, so B, just to remind that B just characterizes the leaf. It's, uh, it characterizes the affine substrate. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. so you are just waiting until you see. Yeah. <coughs> so now, um, now we do the random walk, and for t time steps, this will be a proxy for Hemingway t uh, inputs. Because as we saw that when we do the random walk for t time steps, the Hemingway weight of w is roughly uh, t. So now let's define mk to be the fraction of weight k strings accepted at this leaf. N notice ak was the probability, the, uh, the fraction of the weight k strings accepted at the uh, tree in, uh, in total. This mk is just for this particular leaf. So now through these observations, M mt um, is roughly like pretty accurately approximated by this probability that I do the random walk for exactly t time steps and whether I hit b here or not. So now I had this affine subspace, uh, had some tensor structure, whatever, I just um, leave them all aside and cast this as a random walk question. Uh, we have a graph, we start from zero, what is the chance that I hit node labeled as b at time step t. So in particular, now we don't have any structure anymore. Start from node 0, perform a discrete time random walk, now, denote by s the normalized adjacency matrix. I mean, normalized so that it's stochastic. And now we can write mt uh, like this. right? I start from a point mass at 0, and then do the random walk for t time steps, and then I just measure at uh, point B, what is the chance that I end up here? This, will, this may depend on the subspace this, uh, for this. This random walk depends on the sub subspace. subspace is yes. Worse than others. Yeah, that's true. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I mean, no, notice that these uh, indicator vectors have two norm one. Um, OK, so more generally, let's take two positive valued uh, unit vectors, u and v and define mt uh, to be this. Start from uh, a distribution, like a u, uh, and then do the random walk for t times st steps, and then measure at another vector, positive value vector v. And so what can we say about mt as a function of t? That is true for all s, u, and v. OK. so. Here is what Erdos and Shimonovitz uh, conjectured about MT. They say that if U and V are uh, you know, normalized uniform, namely it's the vector, all one's vector divided by square root of n, so that it's two norm is one. And if S is a 0, 1 matrix, they say that for two integers k and t of the same parity, mk to the power of 1 over k is uh, lower bound by mt to the power of 1 over t. So this is how I phrase it. The, how they phrase it is the following. Suppose I have a graph um, denote by wk v to be the number of k blocks starting from at this particular v. And then now what we do is I pick a u uniform random vertex and count the number of k blocks and take this expectation to the power of 1 over k. They say, they conjecture that this as a function of k is monotone increasing, but only on increments of 2. You can easily see, well, maybe not so easily, but it doesn't hold when you switch parodies. So maybe it's good to, I mean, just a very simple example of the subspace is the one generated by the first t coordinate. Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. It's uh, something to, I mean, it has to hold for this very simple. Uh, if, if you, then I'm talking about the matrix now. I'm not talking about uh, your subspace. Mm -hmm. It's querying x1, then it's querying x2, then it's okay. querying x3, right? Uh -huh. 
but when you pick W, uh, if I know, I mean, we should see these conjectures should be trivial in that particular case. Well, it corresponds to a path graph with um, the, the example you give corresponds to a path graph <coughs> where the probabilities are kind of like binomial n choose k versus n choose n minus k. And yeah, I think uh, I'm not sure it's, if it's easy to prove, but uh, certainly it's a simple example. What's the keywalk? What is the keywalk? In uh, Avi's example, no, so, no, uh, k-walk is the num. It's like the, the k-path, but it it can visit the same vertex. Okay. Mm -hmm. Right. So this this is what they conjectured. Actually, even earlier than Ardush and Shimonovitz in 1966, Blakely and Dixon conjectured the following. So for U and V uh, positive valued vectors. Um, the same thing holds. They they restricted it to U and V b being the um, sort of uniform normalized uniform measure. Now they say for any U V of two norm equal to one, it should it should hold, and that's what they conjectured. This is the U equal to right? Here is U equal to yes, yeah, yes. To determine, and then the parity issue is obvious. Right. Um, so if you, in the uv case, u equals v case, and if k and t are even, then it becomes easy due to, I mean, everything becomes PSD in that case. But for odd k and t, it's, it's really where it's um, challenging. In fact, the t equals one case of this is known in Blakely Roy inequality. It's also a famous inequality. Um, it's known. OK, so in this work, we show that, that these conjectures are true, and this uh, restriction of u and v to be the same doesn't matter. So for any u and v of 2 norm 1 positive valued, we have the following. And secondly, we, we prove a, the following. Uh, so uh, you know, this is a monotonistic statement. If you can just prove it for one step, if you can say that when k is equal to t plus 2, this is true, then you just iterate it, you get the entire statement. So alternatively, we can write it as mt plus 2 is lower bounded by uh, mt to the power of t plus 2 divided by t, and simplify, you get it. And OK, so here is what we uh, prove, which actually is needed for the k, uh, k disjointness problem. So for any epsilon, there's a delta such that either I get a t-fold improvement over what has been conjectured. I can improve it by almost a factor of t. But sometimes this doesn't hold, in which case this must be true. Before, is there a, so it means that there is a limit right, to the sequence, if you take it. The sequence m k to the 1 over k, k goes over the even numbers. Yes. The sequence is monotone. And therefore, either it diverges to infinity, or there is some limit. Uh -huh. It seems like an information theoretical, you know, like an amortized complexity kind of. Do you have such a semantic for this? Uh, maybe, maybe. I mean, the proof is information theoretic, which may have. I, I don't know. If, uh, I don't see it. Probably there is. Okay, so now let's see why. Like this is exactly tight, uh, and let's see why. Um, consider the path graph. We have um, t plus 1 nodes and t uh, edges. Okay? So now our u, u is the point mass here, and v is the point mass at the other end. Now the transition, so this is a substochastic. Uh, I mean, with probability al alpha, I transition from x0 to x1. And with probability 1 minus alpha, the walker just uh, goes away, kill, kill, killed off. So the transition matrix is something like that. Um, so now let's first observe that mt for any t smaller than the length of the path is 0. We can, I cannot even reach from the point mass here to the point mass there. Uh, it, I mean, it, these are all 0. And at mt, there's only a way that the point mass can reach, which is if it only goes forward. 
And there's only why, one way to do that. So, and each of them happens with probability alpha. So this is, and t is alpha to the power of t. And m t plus two. Now I actually um, go want to go from x zero to x t. Uh, but I can do one zigzag somewhere, and I can actually do it in t different possible places. I can do one zigzag here and then go, or I mean, because of that, I have t times alpha to t plus two m t plus two. And likewise, you can calculate m t plus four. I, I just have two uh, opportunities to do a zigzag, so that's what we get. Okay, so now let's um, look at these three points. I mean, the the first item here fails and fails in the worst case, worst possible way, because the left-hand side product is exactly zero. I mean, this on itself cannot possibly be true because of as you can see, the essence of it is the reachability issue. The, sometimes the measurement is zero up until some time after which the, there's uh, some re reaching of the mass happening, and then it suddenly jumps. But what we are saying is that if this happens, if you couldn't have reached up until that point, so in the next time step, you'll get a big boost. In the next time step, uh, the erdos simonovitz conjecture would have predicted the next one is bigger than uh, alpha to the t plus 2. But actually, we, we have t-fold improvement, which, which we get here. Um, so mm -hmm. just, just uh, going to say, what uh, family of S, this doesn't look like an affine subspace anymore. I mean, the, the Markov chain here is, is, is more <coughs> general. I mean, what is the family of matrices S of Markov chains? Uh, that uh, captured in your theorem. Exactly this, uh, the example you gave where we have not even a parity decision, but normal decision tree querying the first t coordinates. No, this is a special case, but what is the family of all? Oh, oh I see. This is the, that's a special case, and what that are all S's that you consider in the theorem? What, what are all Markov chains considered? Just the Markov chains arising from the subspace. Oh, this theorem holds for any symmetric. Uh, Markov chain, any symmetric, any symmetric Markov chain. In particular, um, the fact that our Markov chains came from some particular affine subspaces plays zero role. Mm -hmm. um, okay, so um, this is this path example kind of gives the essence of why we have this kind of either or statement. Okay, so I will give a proof sketch for theorem one. Uh, which, which is not going to have this either or statement, but only uh, this one. Okay, so we, um, I mean, it, the, the, the statement already looked probabilistic, but let's uh, set up our, our probabilistic view of it. Go back to it. You said this one it was very quick. What are you proving? Go back again. again. Theorem 1, which. Yeah, so this I just to remember it. Yeah, so this one actually what implies the uh, the conjectures of Erdos and Simonovitz and Blakely and Dixon. This, the other one, this is what we need for the k log k uh, lower bound for disjointness, but not for uh, the other two conjectures. Okay, so let's uh, give a proof sketch. So now we had this positive uh, unit vectors v and v, and we had this symmetric. Uh, matrix S, which we can normalize to be sub-stochastic um, if we want, because um, the inequality we want to prove is T homogeneous. I mean, it, the scaling doesn't change anything. Um, OK, so now let um, mu be the normalized version of U so that it's an uh, actual distribution. We, it was, when stating it, it was convenient to work with two norm equal to one. But here, uh, we'll, we normalize it. So we add a new state, uh, which has transition probability of mu of x to every x in omega. Omega is our Markov chain state space. And then we add a new state b, and then add a transition of probability nu of x, uh, where nu is the normalized version of v. 
And we will relate mt, which was this inner product, to the probability that a walker starts from a and gets to b at t plus 2 time steps. The two time steps are lost in getting into omega and getting out of it. OK, so let's define a walk, uh, make this uh, earlier ideas more uh, concrete. So we have this forward walk, f, that's taking uh, in time steps minus 1 through t plus 1. So we start at a and move to an x and omega in our Markov chain with probability mu of x. And then for t time steps, move according to the Markov chain uh, transition probabilities prescribed by s. And at time step t, uh, wherever we are, we denote it by ft, uh, we transition to b with probability nu of ft and fail um, with probability 1 minus nu of ft. Or just stay where you are. Don't, just don't go to b. Any, anything else is allowed. And what is the probability that I end up at b? It's this inner product where u and v are now replaced with mu and nu. OK, so now we'll define a backwards version. Now I flip the arrows in the other direction, if you notice. I start from um, the b state now. And the time ticks backwards. Time starts from t plus 1, at which I'm at b. And going to time step t, I transition to one of the uh, x's in omega, one of the original states, with probability nu of x. Now with probability 1, now I'm, now I'm inside omega. And then I move according to the transition kernel s for t time steps. And at time 0, uh, you know, no time goes uh, down now. At time 0, I, wherever I am, I transition to a with probability mu of that state. And with 1 minus that probability, I'll, I'll just fail. And what is the probability that a walker starts from b and goes to a uh, at uh, t plus 2 time steps? This, by symmetry of s, it's a, a exactly the same probability. OK, so now let's take the forward walk and create a walk out of it by conditioning that it reaches b all the time. Let's take that walk, condition on it reaching b, and define that walk to be x. Now, by symmetry, you can observe that if you just took the backwards walk and conditioned on reaching A, it would have been the same. Because just take any path and look at what probability is assigned to it by F walk and the B walk, you'll see that these will be the same. And then the claim follows. And moreover, uh, it can be shown that when you take a Markov chain and condition at the end, it's still Markovian. So X is still Markovian. Where we are going to go next uh, is decided solely by where we are and the time step. It's non-homogeneous uh, Markovian. OK, so now we will compare these various walks um, through kullback library divergence. That turns out to be the crucial thing here. So given two probability distributions on the same space, KL divergence is simply uh, the following expression. Sample according to first distribution, look at the log ratios of the probabilities. And now, if P was obtained by conditioning on event on Q, then you know whatever X we sample, it certainly will be inside the event. And the ratio will be exactly the normalization. So this thing would be, the in, in that case, uh, the divergence, we know exactly what it is. It's the probability of the event. And furthermore, uh, KL divergence satisfies a chain rule, which is particularly convenient for analyzing Markov chains. OK. So now I'll give you a general outline. I'll try to give a general outline. So by Gibbs inequality, uh, we know how much xt diverges from ft because xt was obtained by taking it and conditioning on an event, which is the hitting on state b. And we know what the probability of it is, is exactly that. So we know this. And likewise, now we recall that I, we want to make a statement about now longer, two step longer walks, mt plus. Now, if I define xt plus 2 as the same thing with happening on over longer, two steps longer, 
And again, by Gibbs inequality, uh, I have this uh, already uh, you know, calculated for me. So now, this divergence is related to uh, a, mt plus 2, which we want to lower bound. And now, instead of lower bounding it, I may as well show that the divergence of it from the ideal unconditioned walk is small. If I could do that, this is an identical statement to lower bounding and t plus 2. OK, so now. So why, why is it small? Then why is it? Uh, uh, it's just a minus log. So there's, uh, uh, due to that minus, the sign changes. So I mean, in, OK. So to show that this is small, we cannot. It doesn't buy us anything to work directly with x t plus two. We don't have a hold of it. Instead, we'll we'll come up with a random walk z, which will go from a to b in t plus four time steps. Recall that x, this condition walk we have, goes from a to b in t plus two time steps. Now I will create another random walk z, which takes two more steps. And this is because of this fact. I mean, this is the ideal walk that starts from A and goes to B in t plus two time four time steps. I'm just constructing anything. So because of, because of that, this I mean x t plus two is the ideal one. I, if I construct a uh, random walk, it will certainly have the property. And moreover. Unlike x t plus 2, z will be uh, easy to analyze. We can relate it to the uh, x t walk easily. Uh, we will show that its divergence from the unconditioned walk can be related to this shorter walk, in a way. In this why do you have the inequality with z? Why is that not z? So now, if t plus 2 is the following walk. I start from A and do the walk for uh, t plus 2 time steps inside omega, and then transition to B with uh, some certain probabilities given by nu. Now, these don't end up at B all the time. Sometimes they fail, right? With probably 1 minus nu, we failed. Now, when we obtain x, we just condition on it not failing, it going to B. So if Z also goes to B, well, it satisfies the, the same property as X, but X is the optimal one satisfying. We just condition on that. Everything else is maximal entropy in a way. We just con. The length is, is t, t plus 4 versus t plus 2. Is not oh, this, both of them have length t plus 4. Um, be, uh, there's oh, a okay, okay. because the yeah there are the steps of going from a to omega and then going out of omega to b so due to these two steps these um, sh are shifted the same length and one yes they are of the same length one of them is obtained just by conditioning on b the other one we don't know how it is obtained but what I know is that probability one goes to b in the same length so it cannot be better. I'm just trying to, uh, I mean, what you really want to show is exactly what you write there, that uh, the divergence between the conditional one and the unconditional one is small. Mm -hmm. This is supposed to be true for everything. This statement is supposed to be true for everything. Yes. Mm -hmm. But in the example you gave in the past walk, mm -hmm. right, I mean, there are, uh, uh, in the past walk, if t is too short, you just don't reach the ever. So oh, conditioning yes. on reaching yeah. B is yeah. very different. I mean, they're, they're well, different. yes. So, so, what, what, so what this x, x walk itself, we can only define it if there's a non-zero probability of reaching. So, because that's, so that's why I asked you. So yeah. have it on the, t is not arbitrary. It's at least t is such that there is a path. Well, let's just say that the probability is non-zero. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. non yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. Otherwise, it's, it's yeah. not more than that. I don't Right. Otherwise, x is undefined. I mean, we are conditioning on an uh, impossible event. OK. So and now, I, the only idea I want to give is that 
the optimal object is x t plus 2. Why not study it? Study something uh, lesser uh, quality. The thing is that x t plus 2 we cannot analyze, z we can. Um, OK, so I'll, I'll just uh, uh, put this into this chain. So what's going on is that this is just um, so you defined the or you did not define No, this is this uh, magical walk that we will construct which will have these properties. Um, so this is uh, just by Gibbs inequality, the fact that x was obtained by conditioning on a forward walk, or likewise for backward walk. And I just multiply. And the property of the z we construct will, will guarantee that inequality that we haven't seen yet. And this one, as we argued that z is the z is just one walk ending up at b, and this is the optimal walk ending up at b. And this will kind of, and then this we will relate to mt, and this we will relate to mt plus 2, and this way the everything will follow. OK, so now the z walk. So what, what it is? Uh, so now recall x walk. This, is, this was the walk that starts from a and goes to b in t plus 2 time steps. This plus 2 comes from the fact that we ha had introduced this new states a and b. And we can run a forward in time or just run it backward in time. If we do that, it will take us from b to a with probability 1. OK, now, how is z constructed? Now we pick a uniform random time step uh, between 1 and t pick an integer between 1 and t uniformly at random. And for time steps smaller than this chosen j, just imitate x. Just do whatever x would have done. The z walk just walks like x walk up until step j. At step j, we walk like what the backward walk would have done from this state. Now, we walk according to the distribution xj minus 1 condition on xj. Wherever I am, I'm just assuming this pink walk ended up here, where it would have gone. I just sample the next state according to that. Now, after doing this, I'll just walk like the x walk again, the forward walk again, except that I'm lagging two steps behind now, because I lost one step, two time steps, by going forward and then just compensating for it, doing essentially no progress. So now when we do this, you, will, you can see that we are distributed at each time step i uh, smaller than j. We are distributed exactly like xi. And for every time step bigger than j, we are distributed exactly like x uh, i minus 1. So Due to this fact, at time step 2 more than what x would have come to be, we will arrive at b, the final state b. That's what we know. Yeah. So the x, ah, so the top denoting the following. So we have this x walk. If I start from A and do this x walk, it will probably, with probably 1, will take me to B. Now, what I can do is that I can run the same walk backward in time. Sure. Starting from B, I can, and it will probably 1, take me to A at the end of. Okay, so now for this one, I take a random i, and you walk forward, that many steps. Yeah. So at time step j, now, if I went uh, walk according to x j plus 1 condition on x j, I would have gone just like x. But I, that's not what I'm doing. But what I'm doing is that what would the pink walk would have done at this time step uh, if it was at this state at this time step? I sample the next state according to that. So the pink walk probably would have gone this way. And then I just now switch gears and start walking like the forward ball, like walk, uh, forward version of x again. Uh, but uh, now, according to what it would have done. Just one time, just go and forward. Yeah, so at time step j, we just roll back the time. And then okay, 
just going, keep going forward from, from there on. Some kind of perturbation argument. Yes. And now, I mean, our goal was to construct a longer walk. We just wasted two time steps. There are so many ways to waste two time steps. But this one that you can analyze, that's the uh, whole argument uh, the, in the rest of the talk we'll be analyzing this. Um, OK, so now this forward walk, uh, the, the divergence of x from the forward walk, we knew what this was. It's the minus log of the probability of hitting the B state. So just a second, I mean, just a high level. Uh, I mean, the perturbation argument is, is intended somehow to get rid of the condition. That's what we are trying to uh, so the trying to, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the whole problem of analyzing this mm -hmm. is we have a condition and we are trying to say that it we does not affect much uh, uh, the divergence uh, mm -hmm. uh, between the condition and unconditioned one is yeah. small. Mm -hmm. So that's the real, real, in another way of saying it is that this conditioning, if there is already a positive probability of reaching B, mm -hmm. does not affect the probability too much. Right, but the the way we go around doing it is the following. So the the observation will be that the divergence terms in every single time step of Z will be something we already know so well. The, these will be exactly terms that are found in the expansion of uh, the X walk. Uh, so I'm just trying to get the intuition of the calculation. What, mm. why, why is something like this useful? So why? Why, why is this particular, not this so particular? I mean, one, one advantage is to say is that you can calculate mm -hmm. it. So you, you yes. Yeah, but the other, I mean, there must be some intuition why a perturbation of this nature should establish that the divergence is small. Well, this you can see that this barely is the maximal entropy way of doing it. But when you walk like this, the divergence is already this term. Um, so you can well say that let's go back and let's walk according to maximal entropy way. And this cannot be worse than that. And this we already know. You can also do that. But we don't do it it's to say one relaxation. We just say, OK, let's go exactly like what we know already how to analyze. OK, so now um, let's look at this, um, the divergence of x from the forward walk. Now using the chain rule, this will be just the sum of the uh, divergences that we accumulate over every single time step. We can just split this into time steps. So in particular, this one, um, you know, f walks according to mu. Uh, into the omega. If you go back here, so f goes one of the x's in omega with probability mu of x. But when we condition, now x walk doesn't do that. x walk does a somewhat different uh, walk into the omega, and this will introduce some divergence. It will be exactly that. So this thing, using the chain rule, can be understood as what, we, what divergence do we introduce in the first step? And given this in the next step, how do we differ uh, in probabilities going to the next step, and so on, up until uh, we reach the final state b, which happens at time step t plus 1. And likewise, we can look at this. Um, we can do the pink walk, namely do the x walk backward in time, and see how it differs from the B walk. B walk was the unconditioned backward walk. And this quantity we also know right, to be exactly minus log of the probability of starting from B and hitting A. And now we expand this using the chain rule also. Now the interesting thing is that for any fixing J, when we do this expansion using the chain rule, it will be just a bunch of term, summation of a bunch of terms that we already know. So what happens is that these terms come from the upper line. This term will come from the second line. And again, these terms will come from the first line. If I uh, carefully collect them, 
they will uh, just sum up to uh, really nice things. So now, if I do this over all different, let's look. Let's just sum this term in the expansion of this. Just sum the red terms in the expansion of Z. Uh, for a fixed J, we just have one term. We don't know what it is exactly. But what if I average this over all possible J's? Then I, I can stitch these pink walks, pink steps together to obtain this pink walk. Now that's uh, exactly what we do. Now average over J, the red uh, terms. We will get exactly the backward, the divergence of the X rolled back from the unconditioned backward walk. But I, actually, we, we will not be getting uh, the, the very first and very last steps, because we cannot do the zigzag there. We can only do the zigzag at an uh, integer between 1 and t. So we will be missing two, two terms here, the, the, the term uh, corresponding to when we enter omega from here, and then we exit omega to the state a. And likewise, now just sum the blue terms. I mean, just um, maybe sum j, the j minus 1 uh, terms and together, separately, it will be exactly like summing up the pink terms. And the rest, when you stitch these two parts, then ex you exactly get this from the expansion. I mean, what I'm saying is that if you take the steps up until j minus 1 and all the steps from j plus 1 onward, uh, we get exactly this, this set of terms. So it will, we will get exactly this. So uh, by averaging over j, we'll see that the sum of the blue terms in the expansion of z is uh, that. And now if you put these three terms together, we almost get what, what we claimed at the beginning. I mean, we had this idea of constructing a z which will which was going to be upper bounded by that. But actually, we proved something stronger. Um, we actually show that due to this um, steps at the very beginning and very at the end, we actually proved an even sharper bound on z, the divergence of z. But um, yeah, let's not be too happy about it, because they will exactly cancel out those scalings that we have done uh, taking u to mu and v to nu. So now, so these, we had like these four um, extra terms. It turns out that uh, it's convenient to sum these together and these two together, uh, because these talk about what happens at the very beginning of time, and these two talks about what happens at the very end of the time. So when we analyze these, we can relate these to uh, second order entropies of this mu and nu distributions. These are just the uh, second entropies of them. And so we showed that this is true even with a slack of this much. But um, yeah, when we substitute u and v back here, these exactly cancel out. Um, due to that, we, we exactly get this with no constants. All right. So. Now, I, I, I think, so I want to make this point that um, no, what prob and it's the same proof holds for the Hamming distance uh, in the communication complexity. Here, we crucially use the fact that this mu and nu are not point masses, but arbitrary two norm vectors of. Uh, now, something really remarkable is that the Hamming cube has this tensor structure, concentration of measure, all these properties. And as far as the k-hamming distance is concerned, these are completely irrelevant. The only th property that we use is that the, it's symmetric. And the second property is that if we walk for t time steps, the hamming distance that we have introduced is t, as long as t is small. And I mean, notice that this is not related to the expansion properties of it. If you take the line graph, if you walk for well t time steps, you'll be this distance t away. So 
it was quite remarkable to me that the tensor structure did not play any role. And I have this conjecture that, um, that this log convexity statement um, has an analog version for continuous time. And if this is true, uh, this gap Hamming problem in which we want to distinguish Hamming distance k versus k plus square root of k now, the gap is bigger. Um, that will also follow from a statement that's, that applies to any symmetric chain. I mean, right now, all the proofs use the concentration of measure in a very signif significant way. You and should say it's known that well, it's hard to distinguish k and k plus square root of k lines I mean, the, in the communication complexity. I mean, a low bound of, of k. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Of a gap and, uh, before that. Yes. Yeah, so this result is known. Yes, it, it no, is not. Not with the low K, but with the... No, yeah, it doesn't hold that. Yeah, I, I, I should say this is already known, but if this is true, this would give another explanation to it, which is kind of like not using the tensor structure of the Hamming cube, which I find very interesting. So here's a conjecture. Now, um, take any symmetric matrix and consider the continuous time random walk, and let U and V again be... Uh, Positive distribution, uh, positive unit vectors, and um, so the, our theorem too, which I didn't prove, is a saying essentially that this MT sequence is log convex, and uh, I claim that a similar relaxation of log convexity holds for this continuous time as well. Um, I mean, notice that if I had, let's say mt minus alpha times mt plus alpha bigger than mt squared, that would have been the ac actual log convex midpoint log convexity. Now, mt is a number between 0 and 1. Due to Cauchy-Schwarz, you can verify that it's never bigger than 1. So increasing its power is actually making this inequality weaker, because when you raise this to a larger power, this is some, something smaller. So this is a relaxation of log convexity. And um, well, it's. The, for the discrete time, everything interested, interesting already manifested itself on the path graph. And I, this is what happens on the path line, um, real line. What we get is something like Brownian motion. And I conjecture that it's the extremal example. And th that's what you get for that. And. All right, um, thanks, thanks a lot, and I will be happy to answer questions. <laughs> <laughs>